case of the rebellious child, the Torah refers to him as Ben Soramora. Ben usually indicates a minor, but it's referred to as Ish. Ish indicates he's an adult. He's just entering into adulthood, but still it's not clear whether he's an adult or not. So the Gemara explains they were talking about a child who just became bar mitzvah and he's less than 13 and three months. Why is he referred to as Ben? Because you only see a person as an adult if he's able to impregnate a woman. So if he has relations with a woman and he impregnates her, it takes three months for it to be noticeable that he, he impregnated her. Because the pregnancy is only recognized after three months. So he's Ish, he's an Ish, but he's a Ben. It's not obvious to all that he's an adult. So we're talking about a child between 13 and three months he goes and he steals from his parents the amount of money that he's able to buy a certain amount of meat and wine. And this is referred to as the rebellious child and the parents take him to court and they say to the court, our child is assuming gluttonous behavior and he stole from us to buy meat and wine. The court gives him lashes and they warn him that if he repeats this behavior again, he will be put to death. And he repeats it again and he's put to death. So the question is, he only stole. Stealing is not something which creates a liability of the death penalty. So Chazal, the Gemara tells us that since ultimately he's become addicted to this gluttonous behavior to support his habit of wine and, and wine and meat, he ultimately, he will consume all the possessions of his parents and to support his habit, he'll go and even he'll become a highwayman, he'll commit murder. So because this will lead to a situation where he'll become a menace to society, it's like a drug addict, therefore better he should die in an innocent state, relatively speaking, than in a more culpable state. That's the reason why this rebellious child is taken out, is put to death after he's repeated this kind of behavior. That's Chazal. But it says better he should be taken out in relatively more innocent than more culpable, more liable, a murderer. Now what's exactly? Say, well, he's developing, he's developing an, an addiction. So because of the addiction, to prevent it from going from bad to worse and ultimately compromising the safety of society, we take him out. However, if we look in the Midrash, that's not the understanding. The Midrash tells us Why do you put this child who just entered into adulthood to death for becoming a repeated offender? The Torah foresees ultimately the path of this rebellious child. Ultimately, he will consume all the assets of his father, of his parents, with these uncouth people he eats and drinks with them. And he has to support his habit, and yet he doesn't have the means. He goes out to the crossroads, he becomes a highwayman, and he kills to support his habit. Better he should die, be put to death in a more innocent state, rather than in a more culpable state. When a Russia is put to death, it's in his best interest and the best interest of the world. It's in his best interest because he can't continue to sin. And the world, because again, in terms of his influence and his negative effect on the world. What does the Torah juxtapose to right after the portion of this rebellious child? If the person has a liability 
that he deserves to be put to death, and he's put to death. What's the Torah telling us? In Nitzel Mizel, Lo Nitzel Mizu, although he was saved, and he was not put to death as a Ben Sorah as this rebellious child, at the earliest stage, ultimately, he will be put to death because he's a murderer. So what do we, what's the takeaway? The takeaway is Shavero Gorer Savero, O Mitzvah Gorer Mitzvah. That the reason why this addiction brought to something much more serious, it's not just an addiction. It's rooted in the principle of Avera Gorer Savero. One sin engenders, encourages another sin. And if, if you remember, I've mentioned many times in the name of Rechaim Voloshna, which is based on the Zohar, that when one sins, it creates an impure force. And that impure force actually engulfs the person and it draws him to do more of, of, this, of, 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 of similar, of the same. And that's Avera Goras Avera. So because here he had stolen from his parents to buy the meat and wine and he becomes a repeated offender, it creates this impure dynamic which brings him to the more serious state to commit murder. So it's rooted in Aver Goras Avero. In last week's portion, we read about if a person kills him inadvertently, he flees to a city of refuge. But it's only what happens if he kills, it's premeditated murder, he lies in ambush and kills a person, and he flees to a city of refuge. So then the city of refuge does not protect him. The court sends, the Sanhedrin sends agents, they take him out of the city of refuge and he's put to death for committing murder. So Rashi over there, but the Torah gives us an introduction. A person who hates his brother and he lies in ambush and he commits murder. So Chazal said, the Medjush asks, why does Torah have, have to give us the background that he hated his brother and therefore he lied in ambush to take the person's life. So Chazal tell us, the measure tells us, because why did he ultimately lie in ambush to kill? Because he violated the negative commandment of hating your brother. Since he violated the negative commandment of lo sisnes or chicho, you hated your brother, therefore ultimately it led to ritzicha to lo tirzach. I'll read you Rashi. It's Rashi, if you take a look in um, the portion of Shoftim, It's Perik Yutes Posig Yiralif. The Posig says, the Chiyav Ish Sony the Reyu. A person hated his fellow, the Oravlo, the Komolo, the Kol Nefesh from Mess. And he lied in ambush and he rose and he had smitten him and he had died. So Rashi cites Chazal. Aidesin also who boli de Voravlo. Due to his hate, he lied in ambush. Mikan Omru, Ova Odom al Mitzvah Kala, Sova Lava al Mitzvah Chamura. That if one transgresses a less severe mitzvah, ultimately it will bring you to violate a more severe mitzvah. Visha Ova al Osisna, Sova Boli de Shvichas Domim. That's exactly what the Torah is revealing over here. The principle of Avera Goras Avera is being stated here. This is even more explicit than we have here. Here it's learned from the juxtaposition. Ben Sora Morris juxtaposed a man who actually has a liability of the death penalty is put to death. Here, the Torah wants to have to give us the introduction that he hates his brother and therefore he lies in ambush. Say a person who kills. He, he, and he flees to the city of refuge. He's not protected because only the person who kills accidentally, inadvertently is protected. The, terrorist, the answer is the, is giving, the Torah is giving us the background. What caused him? to commit murder because he violated the, the negative commandment of lo sisno Israel. You violated the negative commandment of hating your brother. Now, in this parsha we have multiple, multiple mitzvahs. The Torah t speaks about Shiloh HaKan. If you send away, you find, come upon a mother bird nesting on its chicks on it, or, or on its eggs, there's a mitzvah to send away the mother bird and take the chicks. What, what is that juxtaposed to? It's juxtaposed, it says, if you build a home, a house, you should put a parapet on the roof. So what is the Torah telling us? That if you send away the mother bird, you'll merit to build a new house and put the parapet on the roof. 
Maxiv Achrov, what does the Torah juxtapose to that? Lo Sizra Kharmachal Kiloyim. You're not permitted to plant your vineyard next to a wheat field. What does that mean? Tiske Lekerem Lizro Soda. You'll merit to fulfill this mitzvah to have a vineyard and to plant a wheat field. Maxiv Achrov. Torah continues. Lo Sachshosh Bishor Vachamor Yachtov. You're not permitted to plow, to work with two species of animals, an ox and a donkey. Tiskel lishvorim v'chamorim. This is all based on the principle of mitzvah v'eres mitzvah. Maxi v'achrov, lo sil You're not permitted to wear a combination of wool and linen. Tiskel l'bogodim noim. You'll merit to have quality garments. Mitzemer l'bogodim noim pishton, Made of wool and linen. Maxi v'achrov, gedilim tasaloch. Torah says, if you have a four-corner garment, you have to put Tzitzis on the four corners. Tiske lemitzis tzitzis maxiv achrov. Ki ikach ish isha. Afterwards it says if you a man marries a woman. Tiske leisha ulebonim. You'll marry a wife and have a family. Harei lo madnu. So what are all these juxtapositions? One following the other. These multiple mitzvahs. What does it teach us? She mitzvah goreres mitzvah. One mitzvah engenders another mitzvah. Avera goreres avera. Therefore, all these various portions, they have nothing to do with one another. One actually engenders the other. That's what it juxtaposes one after another. But it's interesting. If you think about when you speak mitzvah, whereas mitzvah, you do a mitzvah, it engenders another mitzvah. You send away the mother bird, you build a house, and you put a parapet on the roof. Now, the question is, the person can't afford to build a house. So how do you put a parapet on your roof? You can't afford to pay rent. Definitely you can't afford to put down a down payment on a house. The answer is that since mitzvah or mitzvah, one mitzvah engenders another mitzvah, Hashem will provide the means to be able to afford to build the house to put a parapet. Now you finally, you build the house, you put a parapet. You did a mitzvah makir. One mitzvah engenders another, you will not you'll be able to fulfill the mitzvah not to plant a vineyard next to a wheat field you don't have the means to have a vineyard or you don't have the means to have a field or means even to purchase seed hashem will provide you with the means because since mitzvah is mitzvah you have to have the setting and the circumstance to be able to do the mitzvah so hashem will provide you with the means and this way it goes one after another so if you do a mitzvah how do you how do you have the follow-up? You know something? Hashem works it out. <coughs> Hashem will provide the means to be able to have the follow-up. And you have this continuum of one mitzvah leads to another. So a person leads his life. But again, you all, we all understand. When we say mitzvah or mitzvah, it's not a simple situation. So what do we see, you know? person sends away mother bird. The man lives in a rental. should be able to put up a house to put a parapet on the roof. The answer is, as we know, that everything's determined by the quality of the mitzvah itself. What about a person does a mitzvah not with the proper intent? He does it not lishma, not for the sake of the mitzvah. He's not doing it because he wants to bring about greater levels of kedusha. He wants to do, do the will of God. <clears throat> Even though we may say mitzvah is mitzvah, but it's not so simple. A person has money. He's able to do a mitzvah. He says, you know, I prefer to go on a vacation. You're able... To use that money to hire a tutor to teach your son Torah. And you know something, I think I can teach my son, pay, get a tutor to teach him martial arts. Or to become, uh, to go ice skating. Or to go skiing. Rather than use it and invest it in mitzvah. Or to support Torah, or whatever it is. That person also, when it comes to Shulach HaKam, all of a sudden that you read all about it, that it brings all kind of good things, you're into Shulach HaKam, sending away the mother bird. Why aren't you into Torah, Tal Talmud Torah, Kenegat Kulam? If the mitzvah Torah is the equivalent of all mitzvahs combined, the answer is it's not so simple. You know, as we say, you know, a person speaks a good game. You speak a good game, you talk a good game, but bottom line, what is the quality of your mitzvah? So, but there's no question, a person does a mitzvah in the qualitative context, lishmo, for the sake of God, then that creates that kedusha, that dynamic, which brings the other and as a result of that, since it's impossible to do, to execute the mitzvah, Hashem provides you with means to be able to bring about the end result, which is the mitzvah. 
So this is again, I mean, Kemach in Torah. There's a Orachim HaKodesh in Zosef Rocha. It says, Smach Zulm B'Tseisecho V'Yisocho Bo'olecho. Zvulin, we know Yaakov was set up a partnership between Yisocho and Zvulin. Zvulin was responsible for the financial support, the material support of Yisocho, that they should not be distracted from their, their studies. So Moshe Rabbeinu says to Zvulin, Smach Zulm B'Tseisecho. Rejoice, Zvulin, when you go out on your sea voyages to earn money because Yisochah Ba'olecha, because Yisochah is in the tense of Torah studying Torah. So Rechaim HaKadosh asks, a person goes on a business trip, do you know that you're going to succeed? So how could Moshe Rabbeinu says, Zvulah, rejoice when you go out. When you're going out on this, embarking on this endeavor to succeed, you can already rejoice in advance. How do we know? So he explains that if a person goes out with the intent to support Torah, there's no question he will succeed. He will succeed. Therefore, you could rejoice in advance even before you've made the success. See, so he says over there, we read in Pirkei Ovis, Emen Kemach in Torah. If one does not have flour, there's no, you, you can't have Torah. So therefore, a person has to take out time to earn the material to be able to live. We're physical beings. So he explains, Im en kemach in Torah. If there's no, one does not have the means, that's an indication the Torah is deficient. Because if the Torah would be proper Torah, Hashem would provide the means. Again, Im en kemach in Torah. If en kemach, that's a confirmation the Torah you're studying, it's faulty Torah, there's something wrong with it. Because if it was the type of Torah God would want, God would provide the means. 